Hello, my name is Elisha, I'm your TA, and today we're going to be talking about the Chicano Movement. Now, in order to fully understand the Chicano Movement, we're also going to talk a little bit about the Cold War, just some of the stuff that wasn't fully covered by the book, and how it was directly related to creating the Chicano Movement and the Civil Rights Movement. So I'm going to try to avoid talking too much about what was already covered in the chapter, and instead, we're going to talk about this idea of the nuclear family and its role it played in developing American culture. And now I do apologize, I do not have a working webcam, so instead I'm going to be putting up photos as the discussion continues and how they're relevant to the lecture. So to begin, we already know about the Cold War and the rising tensions between Russia and the America. And Americans used this to help define themselves through defining themselves what they weren't. We knew that we were standing against communism, against Russia, anything associated with the two, and in doing so defined our own identity and how we functioned as a society. And one of the ways this pervaded American culture was in the idea of what was a family, and this idea of a nuclear family. So there was a specific criteria to be defined by the nuclear family, and it excluded the vast majority of the American population. So the the characteristics of the nuclear family were they were typically a white family, American-born citizens, and they followed traditional gender norms. The wife was expected to take care of the children, cook, keep the house clean, be the perfect housewife, that stereotypical ideal. The father was expected to work and come home, so on and so forth, be that patriarchal figure, and have approximately two children. They're expected to be middle class and be their own separate familial unit outside of their extended families. You were also only expected to speak English and be straight, and this really narrowed down who could meet this idyllic image of the nuclear family. And though people tried, if they didn't meet every single criteria, then they were looked upon with skepticism and suspicion. And if you were a part of that group, your patriotism and loyalty was already assumed. And as a result, it was particularly people of color, single men and women, lower class families, immigrants, and anyone in the LGBTQ community being targeted as communists or sympathetic to communism. And a good example of this is in the Zoot Suit Riots. And though it's a little before the Cold War really took hold, it's still a good example of the possible consequences that could be in store for an individual or a community that didn't conform to this overall American idea of what defined American or uh, Americanness. So. Mac is going to cover the Black Power Movement and the Civil Rights Movement, and so we're going to focus primarily on the Chicano Movement. And the reason that I brought up the nuclear family and this American ideal that came out of the Cold War is because it was this idea, along with other concepts, that, uh, that civil rights groups were fighting primarily against. They wanted to express their own different cultures, but still belong to the same nationality and still express that same level of patriotism and not be looked upon with that aforementioned skepticism. Now, the Chicano movement is typically considered to have started in the early 1960s in the southwest of the United States, and it started with the United Farm Workers. And these are started by Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, and they advocated for farm workers who were Mexican-American or Latino, and they fought for those who couldn't speak English, and they fought for reasonable hours, higher wages, and increased systems of support that represented and advocated for farm workers to make sure that they got all their benefits and things of that nature. And so often these people who either struggled with or could not speak English could be roped into contracts and situations that they didn't agree to or didn't do so knowingly. And so they could be taken advantage of. And these two and the organization really helped to make sure that they were actually going into a working situation with the knowledge that they needed to make a, an accurate decision. So like I mentioned, the actions of these individuals already stood in contrast to American culture and to this ideas of the nuclear family. And so there was often a lot of pushback, whether it was systemic or individual, against these advocates, against these activists and organizations. But they were still effective. And they did, they were effective because they still worked through the avenues and the systems of organizations that were already set up by the government. Although they would boycott and petition lobby senators, things like that, they still worked within the traditional means, which was typically slower, and it became a criticism later by other groups 
and we're going to talk about them in detail because they saw it as a problem, and so they moved outside of those traditional norms in order to find more effective, more public, more rapid forms to create the change that they wanted. In South Texas in the late 1960s, the Mexican-American Youth Organization, or MAYO, was organized by Jose Angel Gutierrez, Mario Campeón, Juan Patlan, Ignacio Perez, and Willy Velasquez. And what they did is they founded the organization in San Antonio, but really focused their efforts initially on a tiny town called Crystal City, Texas. And they chose Crystal City partly because Jose Angel, was, that was his hometown, and so he had seen the racial issues that were already there. There was a large population discrepancy between those who were Latino and those who were white. And this was really made clear in their school boards and their local politics. And those who had those positions were predominantly white and there were very little Latinos who were advocating for other Latinos or expressing Latino culture. And one of the ways that, the reason that the school board really came under fire was because Spanish wasn't allowed to be spoken in school, they were reprimanded if they did so, there was no Latino history that, or they would be depicted in negative lights. And so this really outraged a lot of parents, and though they, a they appealed to the school board, they weren't getting the results they were looking for. And so one of the ways that they expressed their activism was through something called walkouts. They would either not take their kids or their children would walk out of school. And once this had gone on for a period of weeks or months, this really started to hurt the school district, and they tried to retaliate in some ways. For example, they would threaten to call the police, they would threaten to expel kids. At one point, they even canceled school for a while. They said it was an early break and started and ended the school year in the early part of the year, and they gave them like a six-month break to kind of calm everybody down and see if they could get them back to school. But it didn't really work. And once this had gone on for a period of weeks or months, what these parents would do is they would rally the local community together and get the teachers to help out these children. And so they would meet in public places like parks, cafeterias, and they would have the lessons there instead. And they would teach them in Spanish, they would teach them language, and they would teach them both sides of history and not depict historical figures that happen to be Latino or Chicano in a negative light. Eventually the school board did give in and they started appointing Latinos into the committee, but it wasn't enough for La Raza Unida and eventually they started setting their political goals higher and they were primarily looking at state governors, um, mayoralities, and this was primarily to get them to be taken seriously as a political party and be recognized by the nation as such. And so what the founders of La Raza Unida did is they would have conversations with those of the black power movement some of the leaders and get tips and advice on how to effectively express this political activism ways that really worked and brought about the change that these founders were looking for now sometimes this more active and radical expression came back to hurt their reputation a little bit and i'm referring to one instance in particular that's literally called kill the gringo and it was first said by Jose Angel Gutierrez uh, during an interview, and he said that we need to kill the gringo. And newspapers and people ran with it, and they were making accusations that he was talking about literally killing white people and having Mexicans and Latinos take over. And it wasn't the case. He later amended it, saying that he was talking about a metaphorical gringo. And he was specifically referring to economically and politically killing them that way. Latinos would be on the same playing field as whites. He wasn't meaning it in a physical regard, but nonetheless, the reputational damage was kind of done. And a lot of people were initially hesitant to join with the party because they didn't want to be associated with that degree of radicalism. Nonetheless, they were still very effective in rallying the support of voters, and they did so using some creative methods. And some of the ways that they did this was partly because they were on a shoestring budget. None of them were upper class, and so all of them were using their own money out of pocket to travel. And so what they would do is they would actually visit people's homes and have campaign speeches in their backyards. And they would talk to them in Spanish, talk about local politics, local issues, and it really resonated with the people in Texas, and it quickly spread to resonate with people all across the nation. Now some of the people that really became leaders nationwide of La Raza Unida were in other states who helped further the cause, or La Causa, and they were Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez and Reyes Tijerina. 
And Reyes Tijerina was mostly in Arizona, and he fought for land rights for other people. And he would bring back old contracts that were made with the Spanish or with Americans who gave them this land, but they never followed through with it. And so he essentially brought them to the courts and was trying to make them follow their end of the bargain and return this land to the Latino owners. Now, the second person was Rodolfo Corque Gonzalez, and he was based out of Denver, Colorado. He was born there, and he already started his political activism, and he had a similar agenda to La Raza Unida, which is why he later would join on, but he had his own thing called the Crusade for Justice. And its main goal was creating community control and self-determination for Chicanos and for Chicano communities. And by 1969, he was already holding conferences, uh, rallying people, doing things like that, and he came up with what was called the Plan de Aslan. And we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about what the Plan de Aslan was, what Aslan was, and, sorry, three. We're also going to talk about what the term Chicano was. So the Plan de Aslan was literally the blueprint through which these political activists and um, Gonzalez's political groups were supposed to move through and the goals that they were supposed to set. They were very nationalistic, they were pretty radical, and they were going to create this um, ideal space for Chicanos. Now the term Aslan is in itself unique and it's actually in reference to an Aztec myth. And the idea is that Aslan was supposed to be this mythic birthright homeland for Chicanos and it quickly became assigned to the southwest area of America from Texas to California, up into Colorado, this became the area that the Chicano population was going to make their own. And some took it metaphorically, others took it literally, and you actually see this become an issue later on in La Raza Unida. Regardless, Corky Gonzalez came on in the early 70s and the party was up and running. Now, the term Chicano is in itself a noteworthy name because it was previously a derogatory term for those of Mexican descent or Latinos. Now, what they did was they co-opted the term and made it a term of pride. A, and this was to define that they were American citizens, but they weren't white, and they were refusing to assimilate. They were still going to be Mexican or Latino, and they were still going to express that within the confines of American culture. Now back to the political party. So by the early 1970s, La Raza Unida was up and running. It had these faces, the, these personalities that were really resonating with people, and they were all campaigning for a guy named uh, Ramsey Muñiz. And because of how popular they were getting, they decided to hold a national conference. Now this national conference was held in 1972 in El Paso, and the founders were shocked at the number of delegates that actually showed up. People were hitchhiking, renting cars, borrowing cars to get to this. The level of convergence that occurred uh, shocked everyone, simply because there were delegates from places they didn't even know there were. Um, all the way into the East Coast, way up north, they came from all over the country. And though they knew that they dominated in the Southwest, they were surprised to see such a turnout. And there was approximately 1,500 people that showed up, and about half of them were women. And this was widely seen as a point of a unity amongst the political group and amongst Chicanos. Now this would also be a point of divisiveness within the party because as talks went on, decisions were made, and conversations were being had, it was difficult to, for the leaders amongst themselves and amongst the states to get a consensus between one another on what the future should be, what their agenda should be, and what priorities should be handled first. And they never really came to a consensus, and unfortunately this really started to hurt the group, and though they stuck around to the late 70s and early 80s, by that time the Democratic Party had figured out that the, there was an untapped opportunity that could be taken advantage of by appealing to Chicanos. And so they began adjusting their advertisements and their campaign strategies to appeal more to Chicanos. And since they had a larger budget anyways, they were able to reach more of them. And so as this transition occurred, more and more people began to pull away from La Raza Unida. And the party was basically dead by the late 80s. Now what La Raza Unida did for the Chicano population is noteworthy because it broadened the sense of community by the Chicano population. 
it w took it from local communities and made it nationwide and also opened the door for Chicanos to express their nationalism and their patriotism for their country through this Chicano filter and they were able to embrace the cultural aspects and historical aspects of their own cultures and still be supportive of the country, of the nation, w and still fight for equal rights at the same time. Though this was the end for La Raza Unida, you can see its legacy carried on in the literature of the late 80s and throughout the 90s by Chicano activists and academics. You see a lot more books start coming out of bibliographies, of histories, of the Chicano perspective and of Chicano lives and the issues that they've dealt with and these challenge the narrative that was being reinforced typically through the educational system of what American history was and reinserting Chicano involvement into that narrative. And you can see the continuation of La Causa and the legacy of these activists and organizations even today in the debates that are going on about the U.S.-Mexico border, undocumented immigrants, and the issues that are being discovered in the ICE detention centers. Now that is actually the end of my lecture over the Chicano movement and the Cold War, and I'm sorry to leave it on a somber note, but I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have a great day.